Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. My name is Eric, and I'm here with Michael. What is up, Michael? Uh, I think we're going to start year four of Double Feature is what's up. Holy crap. Year four of Double Feature. It's happening for real. What are we doing for the spectacular year four of Double Feature? For the spectacular year four of Double Feature, we're going to do uh, some uh, old school American horror sequels? I don't think that's allowed. Okay. I think they're taking away our old school American horror card. Um, well, regardless, we're going to cover Hatchet 2 and Cabin Fever 2. So it's blood and sex, but it is kind of old school American horror. Mm -hmm. Uh, What we should really celebrate is blood and sex. Right. I'll stand by those things. Okay. Old school American horror. I mean, we've brought it up many a time. Sure. We've talked about the Splat Pack. Our audience knows. We've championed, we've campaigned, and now we're betraying it. (laughs) Well, so what was, uh, everybody knows, but just for record's sake, right? Mm -hmm. For archival purposes. Old school American horror. Not a remake, Mm -hmm. not a sequel. Got it. Not a Japanese one. Uh, I think we can stop right at not a sequel. Yeah. Hatchet 2. What's funny (laughs) is, okay, so. Cabin Fever, right? And this goes all the way back to year one. Yep. This they is, both uh, do. We covered both of the... We covered Hatchet and Cabin Fever a long, long time ago. Right. And Cabin Fever is the kind of movie I would call old school American sure, horror. Sure, but it doesn't brand itself as right. old school American horror, Whereas unlike Hatchet another did. film. Whereas Hatchet was pretty much the only film to right. do this. So if Cabin Fever comes out with a sequel... No big deal, mm-hmm. because, you know... Well, like, and furthermore, Cabin Fever sequel not affiliated with Eli Roth. Right, right. Again... Creating a paradox when it comes to Hatchet 2. But when the guy who creates the movie... Who about creates being... <laughs> the genre. He, he creates the movement. Not a remake, not a <laughs> sequel, not a Japanese one. I guess two for three is okay. Yeah. Adam Green comes back for Hatchet 2. So these are two films that are uh, also really great if you've just watched yeah, the originals. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of kind of continuations, referential stuff... Um, almost feels like when a franchise is gone for 20 or 30 years and comes back and remembers some really important things. Right. Except it's only several years later. Mm-hmm. But for some reason still, I don't think anyone was expecting sequels out of either of these. No, I agree. So we're going to spoil the movies. We're probably going to spoil the original Hatchet and Cabin Fever as well as Hatchet 2 and Cabin Fever 2. Um, if you haven't seen uh, any or all of these movies, you can use the chapters, skip around in the show. There's, uh, there's chapters, and on the website, there's some timestamps if your, say, Zune doesn't support. Right. My point is, if you still have a legacy Zune, a uh-huh. classic, a vintage Zune. Vintage, antique. And you can't see the lyric section, you can just go on our website and, uh, and find the timestamp daily on there. Now, before we start Hatchet, I have one tiny confession to make. Uh-oh. Obviously, just from this conversation right now, um, we talk about Hatchet and Cabin Fever a lot on the show. Mm-hmm. They get mentioned all the time. We're big proponents of those movies. Oh, I'm yeah. a big fan of those movies. I tell people, you know, people ask me, uh, what's your favorite horror movie? Whatever. Hatchet's one of the ones I list mm-hmm. constantly. Uh, Cabin Fever is an Eli Roth movie, and Eli Roth is a fucking genius. Um, I have not watched Cabin Fever or Hatchet, but once in my life when we watch them That's for a the shame. show. It's a total shame. I am a miserable failure. I cannot possibly explain how this has happened. I really do stand by those movies. I think they're great. In fact, I watched them again this week Mm -hmm. because I was so embarrassed by that, but I had to come clean. It's been three or four years. Yeah, that's a shame. Since I have seen them. The damn shame. What is wrong with me? I don't know. I literally have no excuse. I want to tell you that I've been busy watching other stuff, or I I just, I don't know why I haven't seen them again. You watch movies uh, a couple times. I I mean, pretty often. Yeah. Well, I watch, I, I watch every movie that I own twice. I think I'm just really excited to see new stuff, yeah, and me so too. anytime I have two hours to kill, right? I basically never revisit things. Right. Well, and, and the I other really thing should. for me is I show people a lot of movies, and right. uh, and Hatchet and Cabin Fever are high on my show list. I'm going to try and fix that this year. Um, Hatchet Two is where we should start. Then Hatchet Two starts literally right after the previous film, almost literally. 
It starts right after the previous film ends, but one of the cast members in the final shot okay, is a sure. different actor. <laughs> right. So we're supposed to pretend we don't notice that. Right. Do you think part of that, I mean, does that sell Danielle Harris uh, replacing our lead from the original Hatchet? Oh, yeah. I think that that's a good move for two reasons. One, the original lead, I don't know who she was. She was fine. <laughs> okay. Yeah. She was supporting. If yeah. you're bringing her up to lead status, you need somebody that can lead a horror movie. Basically, you, you sort of want a name. Right. And Danielle and Harris is certainly making a name Especially for in the horror community. Because mm -hmm. we saw Danielle Harris back when we did, well, when we did the Halloween Killapalooza. Sure. As four and five, is, right? Yeah, she's the mm -hmm. little girl in Halloween four and five. I believe Michael Myers' niece is something. And then Rob Zombie. Right, again. and then Rob Zombie brings her back for the Halloween remakes. So I guess most of what she's known for is Halloween films, That's which is kind strange. of That's where she was born. So one of the things that's amazing about Hatchet is the place it chooses to end. Yeah. Because it looks like everybody's fucked. And uh, picking up from that moment... I'm kind of curious if you feel betrayed by that at all, or if you think that takes the wind kind of out of, you know, out of the ending of the original movie to see the original movie ends and you go, okay, everybody's going to die. Clearly she doesn't get out of this. And then in hatchet two, she kind of elbows him in the face and swims away. Right. It's actually a pretty easy victory. Right. No, I don't, I don't feel betrayed at all. Cause I feel like, the end of the first movie is a very dire situation, and it's sure. still just as terrifying. It's not like she isn't being held up by Victor Crowley. Right. That's still happening. It's just that she ends up not dying, and she has a whole other separate story. But I feel like that's justified by the amount of blood we get in Hatchet 2 altogether. It's kind of an awakening. I mean, for me to think back to all these horror movies that end with an implied everybody dies right. or the lead dies or you know what's about to happen in the very next frame mm -hmm. and then to think, well, maybe they just elbow the killer and swim sure. away. Yeah, they do it in some of the Friday the 13th movies. The other awesome effect this has is that uh, when she says last night in the movie... It's it's not necessarily winking at uh, the audience, but she means last film. Right. Every time she says last night, you could substitute that for last film. Right. It's like she just watched the previous film right. with us. It's a really nice effect. Danielle Harris isn't the only one in this movie, though. They're, it's a littered with different cameos, and we get Tony Todd back. Sure. Red um, Zombie. Right. Who has a much bigger role yeah. this time around. Right. I guess they kind of lucked out that they left somebody alive yeah. in the original. Right. Especially when you really, I mean, you put up you, on your it, poster, not right, a sequel. Right. You're talking about Jack Cracker. No, I'm still oh. talking about Tony Todd. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I just mean you kill basically everybody yeah, in right. your movie. And then you go, fuck, the studio wants to do another one. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, how do we, who's left, right? So Tony Todd's left and he can carry the weight of a lot of this Absolutely. movie. Absolutely. But Kane Hodder as well. Yeah. Who I can spot these days. You can spot the hotter. I can spot the hotter. I did okay in Frozen. Uh, I'm I'm doing just fine in this movie, and there's a couple other ones I got too. Uh, Sean's brother, right? Right. Uh, who was from um, the original Hatchet? Mm -hmm. What is Sean's brother's name? Justin. And that's great because he was one of. Uh, I guess that's a cheat to bring him back. Yeah. But he was one of the best fucking characters. From yeah. That movie well, and too. they and they they give him a nod when he pretends to be French. Sure. <laughs> sure. Right. With the chips ahoy. And Clayton, who's from The House of the Devil, right, right. which I imagine we'll be talking about later. Sure. But who the fuck else is in this movie? Well, we have um, what's Tom Holland plays her uncle, uh, okay. Bob Dunstan. Sure. And he directed Child's Play and Fright Night, but right. most importantly, Child's Play. He directed that one. And we have, uh, I, I can't, I don't know the character's name, but the guy who never talks. Yes. Was Captain Spaulding's stunt double in certainly, The Devil's Rejects. Certainly. And then we have the, the, the ski lift operator from Frozen, and then also Sean Ashmore is in it. He gets his face cut off. And uh, and then, yeah, like I mentioned before, Jack Cracker's back, and that's uh, what's John Carl Buechler, I think his name is. He's the the mastermind behind the troll film. The Death Curse guy? Yeah. That's He's, amazing. He also does makeup for this movie. Wow, I'm floored. I don't even know what to say about that. The Death Curse guy is a character in this mm -hmm. film, all of a sudden. Right. Bring him back. He's a character. Drinking and his own pee. I know. They, they reprise the... They make a joke, I guess, right. out of the urine drinking and the and what a, would otherwise be a tense scene. And I've mentioned on the show before, I have a terrible fucking memory, but it turns out I remember nothing from yeah. Hatchet or Cabin Fever. The first time I saw Hatchet 2, 
I didn't pick up on... That she was drinking pee. I didn't pick up on the pee drinking. I didn't pick up on the hats and yeah, whatnot. The clothing. Um, there's a lot of stuff I didn't... Obviously, seeing it again this time, after seeing Hatchet again last week, it's like there's all these new jokes they've added to the film. I've right. made my own director's cut by just remembering shit that I should have remembered from the first movie. Something that makes this one a little different is the... I think the story's a little heavier. Mm-hmm. Or maybe it's safer to say mythology is a little heavier. Yeah, well, there's a little bit more background that you finally mm-hmm. get. The first film, it kind of seems like they've been thrust into a dangerous situation and nobody had any idea that it was coming. It's almost bear or no bear at right. that point. Yeah. Doesn't matter what the mythology is. Is he supernatural? Right. Don't care, run away. Yeah. In this movie, there's you get Rev Zombie's backstory where it turns out that her dad and his brother and the bald guy with the beard yeah. are all uh, Trent. That's his name. They were all out there, and they were the ones that set the house on fire sure. that ended up killing Victor Crowley. And so that kind of lends itself to the mythology. And then you get the whole um, hot, sexy Cajun <laughs> maids right. story right? with the curse and the voodoo and the creepy undead dead wife. So this is a little strange, because I remember in uh, our conversations talking about a lot of the earlier horror movies, um, they weren't supernatural. Right. And Hatchet was one of the ones where, in the original Hatchet, they question it. Mm-hmm. They do kind of bring it up. They say, you know, sure. is he supernatural or not? Uh, do you feel like they're confirming a supernatural element in here? I feel like, yeah. I mean, I think the movie is trying to say that, yeah, there's some supernatural element. I think it's a nod to, again, going back to Jason or Michael Myers, where they're physical. They're not ghosts. You can right. still hurt them. But you can't stop them. Right. Because for whatever reason, they are going to come back and they are going to try to kill you. Yeah, because ultimately that's what the original hatchet came down to is not being supernatural. Right. I mean, that was the idea is we can hurt him. We've seen him injured. Sure. I think the only time we really get confirmation of anything supernatural is in the story that's told. Right. You know, where Tony Todd's character, where Reverend Zombie is saying, okay, he's supernatural. Right. And they're showing, you know, all of the voodoo shit. Right. But that's his retelling of the yeah, story. Yeah, and it's still deniable. It's just kind of, I mean, it could always be written off as legend. Kind of reminds me of what was uh, The Exorcism of Emily Rose. Right. Where in the retellings, that's where you see all of the exorcism right. shit. There's some sort of uh, plausible deniability of the supernatural. And in the end, Reverend Zombie's bullshit mythological plan to kill the monster doesn't work. So I'm going to chalk one up for uh, Team Science over here and just hope that that sticks. Yeah, I do love that he puts together this whole plot where he goes, (laughs) wait a second, I've seen a lot of horror movies. I know what to do All he needs to do is he needs to kill the people that killed him and he'll be gone. Yeah, he'll leave. His spirit will be at rest, really. And he ends up doing that and uh, then you get the uh, Victor Crowley comes out the front door. Rev Zombie says... I don't fucking believe it or no fucking way. <laughs> right, right. And then he gets his body ripped out of his skin and thrown into a bush. Ah, oh, that's such a great moment, too. So when talking about all these cast members, there's one name that doesn't come up, yeah. even in the slightest, and that's Joel David Moore. Right. Notably absent uh, from this movie. Mm-hmm. So I'm curious about that, because we know from covering these previous Adam Green movies we also did the fantastic movie Spiral, yeah, uh, where we had a, a chance to talk to Joel David Moore, and maybe that's why he's standing out more in my head. Right. I, I don't think that's true. I mean, he's the fucking lead in the last sure. movie, right? Sure. I'm not just making that up. No, you're. you're I'm not just right. thinking that's the director of Spiral. He's important, right? Co-director of Spiral. We see his shirt and the the kind of logo on yeah. that guy's hat, but that's it. And we're literally, I mean, we're outside. Had we changed the angle in the opening scene, we should be able to see. Joel David Moore's corpse right. in the canoe yeah. still. Right. With no arm. Right. Uh, Mary Beth, not, not phased by yeah. <laughs> this at all. She seems a little traumatized that all of these people died, but she wasn't nearly as close to him as the, uh, the narrative was telling us right. in the previous movie. It almost seems like there's a couple movie cameos in this too. Um, Frozen, which we covered on the show, sure. which was, uh, fuck, that was also Adam Green. Yeah. We've done basically every Adam Green movie. We have done every Adam Green movie. That's good, because in my head, I keep thinking, Adam Green is amazing. We should do all his films. I guess we've probably already covered that. Mm -hmm. Frozen is on the television. Right. They're reporting on it, which is such a clever idea. 
But there's also a Leslie Vernon reference. Yeah, there is. Uh, Leslie Vernon of the uh, the famous film. Behind the Mask, The Rise of Leslie Vernon, written by our friend David Stevie. So, I mean, I want to take a little credit here. Uh-huh. I don't know if this aired, because again, terrible memory, awful editing to the show. Um, but when we were talking to David Stevie, we were chatting with him for a long fucking time, and we mentioned Hatchet. Right. We mentioned the idea of old school American horror. And that Leslie Vernon kind of fell into that. Behind the Mask sort of fell into that idea a little bit. And he had not heard of Hatchet. So here we are bringing up uh, this movie to the writer, who, I mean, if anybody on that set had heard of Hatchet, that would probably be the guy, right? Not fair to say nobody there has has heard of that, but I feel like we kind of brought that movie over to that camp and said, hey, you guys should check this out. And here comes Hatchet 2 paying tribute. Had it been the other way around, we we could almost take credit. credit. You know, for for writing a line in Hatchet. Yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, it, it wasn't the other way around. So Blew close. It. Blew it. We All we have to do now is we just wait for the Behind the Mask sequel and wait till they mention Hatchet, and then we're, we're good as gold. I remember there was a time we were trying to get people to join that Facebook. Yeah. So go do that. This yeah, is a good time to Facebook mention that again. Yeah, go on Facebook and log in. So I bring these references up because I like the way they're done in the movie. This movie could get really meta and just start dropping in these names. Uh, you know, the way they do Jason, right? Right. They just kind of say, oh, like Jason. They don't say necessarily whether they mean, oh, you mean the Jason movies that have come out, you know, every yeah. year for the last couple of years, or whether they mean the real guy Jason. But the fact that one guy in the movie says, you know, in my hometown, Glen Echo, there's they, this guy, Leslie right, Vernon. They established that Glen Echo is a real place. And that Leslie Vernon is actually from that place. I feel like that's a lot better than uh, the meta sort of route of just lazily throwing a reference in. Yeah. You take one extra step to make your fiction the same universe as somebody else's fiction. That is wicked fucking cool. I adore that. Something more up your alley, Chicken Biscuit ringtone. Yeah. What is your ringtone right now? My ringtone right now is actually the Terriers theme. I don't know what that means. Terriers was a TV show that aired on FX and got canceled and shouldn't have gotten canceled. Everybody watched Terriers, but... I've never even heard of this. What? We have to have a conversation later. Go on. (laughs) But I also, for a a period of time, I had the chicken and biscuits and gravy song as my ringtone. Did you make this yourself or where did this come from? I downloaded... I mean, I legally obtained the film. You're a terrible person. And then I stripped the audio, cut out the chicken biscuits and gravy song and bluetoothed it to my phone using the wonders of technology this sounds way more technologically advanced than you did this yeah i'm a little impressed i'm not gonna lie i'm not even sure i would have bluetoothed to your phone yeah i'm not sure you know (laughs) i'm not sure you know what you're talking about right now (laughs) but somehow you managed to do this and i'm thoroughly impressed that's one of the funnier moments of the the oh yeah well that whole character adam green continues to be really fucking hilarious Humor is one of the things that, uh, as slasher movies get cheaper um, or more lazy, they just seem to forego the humor. Right. Uh, When you look at a lot of these cheap, crappy remakes, or uh, not even the remakes, I mean, just cheap, crappy original content, too. You lose out on, you know, a good script, sure. on uh, on good dialogue. Sure. Well, and that's something we've always mentioned you can go back to Adam Green for. A lot of the new horror movies are bent on just terrorizing you. Sure. They're bent on being scary and, right. and any comic relief is going to take you out of the situation. Right. But in honesty, doesn't matter how much fun you're having up until a monster shows up you're going to be really scared. Right. Unless the monster's not effective, right? Unless the killer or the story isn't effective, at which point it, it's not the humor that's failing the movie. Right. It's the entire film. But this movie isn't pulling any punches. I mean, they made the decision to go unrated. Oh, yeah. In fact, the decision to go unrated is probably why we, we have waited this long to cover this movie. Sure. I remember, did you actually end up seeing this in a theater? No, they didn't show it in the city. They yeah. pulled it from all the, all the theaters in Chicago. Yeah, I remember they were going to show it. In Orland Park. Right. And I, I tried to, uh, to buy tickets to this thing, and it seemed like it just sort of vanished overnight. Yeah. It didn't even get a debut right. in, uh, in a lot of these theaters here. And that was because of the studio's decision to go unrated. And unrated means tiny distribution. Yeah. Um, Unrated also means belt sander to your brain. It does. When we did This Film Is Not Yet Rated uh, on the show, I think we talked about that a little bit, how that's just part of the system. If your movie is unrated, 
the theaters think less people will see it, the big chains don't buy it, and you can't fucking find it anywhere. And that's a really tough decision for the creators, and I guess more, uh, more accurately, the distributors to make. But a great decision that they made. This is a phenomenally uh, gory film, I would oh, yeah, say. Absolutely. Uh, the violence is, it's almost humorous, the things that they're doing. But Some of it is very humorous. The, have you ever seen a decapitated man fuck somebody? I have now. It's so over the top, you know, being strangled with your own intestines. It seems like something cartoonish. But the fact that the movie does it with a completely straight face right. and gives it that sort of tone and gravity is really a huge part of the style here. Yeah, absolutely. So the belt sander comes back. That's what that thing's called, right? Yeah, the belt sander. It's my favorite My favorite Victor Crowley weapon. Would you say that's your favorite death? No, not my favorite death. It's just my favorite Victor Crowley weapon. I think it's just such an unconventional, painful <laughs> sure. tool. All battery operated, too. Yeah, in these, uh, I think it's gas sheds. powered. That would make more sense. You mentioned the Tony Todd pull, which is another one of my favorites. Yeah, that one's really good. I think my favorite, though, has to be the head over the table yeah. and the blink at the end. It's just, I mean, it's almost symbolic for everything the movie is. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just got this wonderful level of creativity, gore, and then it's just kind of goofy at the end. Yep. Talking about the signature, though, there's also those signature moments of hatchet. I have literally a bucket of blood and I'm right. going to splash it on this tree mm -hmm. or on this patch of fake bushes sure. over here. Sure. Bloody up the foliage. And here there's an entire cabin that just sprays blood. Yep. Which is really about as far as they could go with that. And then the ending is just as abrupt yeah. as the original. Well, the thing that the ending does, which is amazing, is she takes the fucking hatchet and chops his face up with it. Sure. Which she says she's going to do. Claims, I believe she says, I'm going to bury the hatchet in his fucking right, face. Right, right. And then she proceeds to chop up his face so much that his face looks like a hollowed out watermelon right, with right. a stem in right. it. And you're thinking, he's dead. He's definitely fucking dead. There's no way he's not dead. And then she puts the hatchet down and walks away. Now, this has a nice, almost kind of a poetic ring sure. to it. If the mythology didn't kill him then the poetry of this ending right. has to do it. Right. You're burying the hatchet sure. in the hatchet killer from the movie Hatchet. The audience is going to feel like, well, right. that's it. That's how you kill him, yeah. right? Yeah. Mary Beth doesn't feel like that's it. Right. Well, and neither does Victor Crowley, apparently, because he goes to reach for the hatchet, and you get that moment where you think everyone, everyone in the theater, everyone who watches the movie goes, ooh, here comes the ending where it turns out he's still alive, and he goes to reach for it, and she comes back, with a shotgun, right, points it at the hollowed out whatever is left above his neck and says, what'd she say? Fuck you. Right. And then pulls the trigger and explodes his brain and then end credits. The film doesn't even give itself time to finish the sound of the gunshot. Right. Fuck you over. Really ends in the, the complete opposite of the way the first one sure. does. And then there's the other sequel for this episode, of course, Cabin Fever 2. Uh, full title on this? Cabin Fever 2, Spring Fever. Featuring Ryder Strong? Featuring Ryder Strong, featuring Giuseppe Andrews, directed by Ty West. I'm going to be completely honest. Whoa, Ty West. <laughs> didn't see that coming. Uh, when I heard this movie announced, uh -huh. I didn't know who Ty West was. I hadn't seen House of the Devil yet. Sure. I, I just, honestly, this movie seemed like the biggest mistake yes. that could ever come out. It was Agreed. unaffiliated with Eli Roth. It was, I mean, honestly, we had, The Descent 2 came out bad, Joyride 2 came out bad, 2001 Maniac sequel came out awful. Yeah, you haven't seen any of these on the show. Right. And I'm thinking Cabin Fever 2 is going to be another one of those movies where they try to capitalize on a really good film by giving it the name. Yeah, they take the good two or three years we had there of original content and right. just decimate it. But instead... Cabin Fever 2 is a really fucking good movie. It certainly is. And I'm talking it up entirely good. to Ty West and Giuseppe Andrews. Yeah, Ryder Strong is only in it for a couple minutes. He's in it for comic effect. He's the splat kill you didn't yeah. get from the original movie. You know, that moment they have there where he lands in front of the truck. Is he going to get run over? Little lens flare going on there. And he's miraculously saved this time. School bus coming down the road. Splat and freezes on it, too. Right, while his head is flying off in the air this is the big hey guys i saw the last movie yeah. kind of moment but i also think this is the moment where ty west goes this isn't the same movie 
That's the moment Certainly. where Ty West goes, this movie is gorier. This movie is – I'm going to – basically he says, I'm going to drive a bus all over the tact of the first film. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I think it says less about maybe the violence or the blood, but more about the tact. Yeah. I have a lot of trouble believing this is Ty West, though. Yeah. Isn't it bizarre? I mean, you start with this animated sequence. Sure. Already, it's just, uh, the House of the Devil is our only other piece yeah. of evidence to consider here. So it's hard to tell. Yeah. We can't pretend we know who Ty West is. We've seen one fucking movie of his. But we can definitely pretend. I mean, we don't have to pretend that we've seen House of the Devil and that it's surprising that the same guy it made Cabin really Fever It is really surprising. Too. It's, I can't believe that these two movies have come out by this one man. And, you know, he, he wrote this. He had a partner in writing this movie, but yeah. he wrote this movie, yeah. too. Yeah, and really the only thing that these two movies have in common is that they're great. And water is terrible for you. Yeah. So in talking about both how this is different from the first right. and different from The House of the Devil, right. we start with the animated bit. Yeah, there's a weird animated kind of, it's comic booky. Yeah. It's on it's at the beginning and at the end of the film. Reminds me of the crude MTV Beavis and Butthead kind right. of era. Right. And it's just it basically tells the story of how we got from the small town in cabin fever to this high school. And then at the end tells you how the disease is just going to spread all over and it's unstoppable. Ryder Strong's character was going to tell us that story. Right. But right. Unfortunately, he can't be here with us today. So it's just a weird sequence where it shows red water, which is symbolizing the infected water and fingers, a lot of fingers in this movie, just kind of floating down a river. And it shows that the water bottles, the down home water ends sure. up in a, in, ends up in a high school, the right, night of prom, right. which is also coincidentally two days before Mardi Gras. It shows where the water comes from, how it gets to the school and where the problem kind of begins. And it, it becomes the same thing as the first movie where when you see somebody drinking water, that's when you go up, oh, they're gone. Right. And right. so in this movie, instead of doing it, tactfully like did you catch it he sipped water instead it's just like i give you a blow job i spit your cum into the sink and now i'm going to obviously take a gulp of down home spring water or to go as far as the punch bowl right um to what is he the janitor right the janitor to have the janitor who's probably from the house of the devil uh -huh. maybe the only actor taking this completely right. seriously he almost has kind of a shining vibe to pee in the punch bowl. Right. I mean, really, the only purpose of that scene is to emphasize the punch bowl and to be fucking gross. Yeah, I guess. the pissing blood, pissing hot blood. <laughs> pissing hot blood. You really can't go wrong there, can you? So we know all the ways that this isn't a uh, Ty West movie. Right. Do you see any of his signature here? I mean, I, let's, honestly, let's play like noir detectives here, right? Yeah. What, what Ty West is left over in this movie? How do we know this is the same guy? I think, honestly, the, the only real carryover between the two films is his grasp on teenagers sure because in the first movie we have 80s teens acting exactly like 80s teens and in this movie we have 2k teens acting exactly like 2k teens talking about you know they're talking about getting laid they're talking about how prom sucks not how prom is great because it's not 1950s teens right and they're talking about how they'd rather watch a movie called bride of the cannibal 2 where a guy gets his dick bitten off I love the way that kid announces that, yeah, too. Yeah, and balls. Instead of having these extremely pretentious conversations we have, that's really the conversations you should have sure. about. Well, have you seen Bride of the Cannibals 2? Yeah, guy gets his dick cut off. Yeah. We should totally go. Midnight show. Cool. Two tickets. Have you seen Cabin Fever 2? Yeah, a chick gives birth into a garbage can. So I think aside from the Ty West doesn't know how to end a movie syndrome, I'm kidding. Ty West, master yeah. of film. How dare I say anything bad? You know, Cabin Fever had five or six different endings. That's true. So the fact that this movie does end a little strangely, right? That's not just in my head. It ends it ends a little It's a little weird, that's all I'm saying. It's a little weird, but it, it's I I like it. Yeah, as opposed to the House of the Devil ending where I just said, oh, "Okay, I'm wrong about this. Ty yeah. West knows what he's doing and I just don't." Uh Cabin Fever 2 does end a little strangely. But I think there's far more than that to see in his signature. You know, I think it, I don't want to say the movie's self-aware or anything. But uh he does get what he's doing. You yeah. know the diamond wipes and the yep. I mean, all of the different weird little transitions sure. and the fucking art house cred, yeah. you know, that the guy's using. I think he's still using film for this. I was reading an interview where he was just talking about his love of film and how he it was back in the days of uh, 
of video cassettes. Yeah. So it's not quite in the the realm we're playing now with uh, digital, you know, DSLR and red cam and all that stuff. But this definitely has a very color graded, very dirty look to it. Uh-huh. And then the goddamn lenses. Yeah. I mean, super wide angle lens all over the place, especially in the beginning, you know, when you get the uh, water truck uh-huh. going by or in that uh, principal's office. Yeah. Um, a lot of times you can use wide angle lenses in a, in a place like that, especially when you're not using sets you've built, but actual places that you're going to. And by the time you get a camera in there, that principal's office looks fucking tiny. Sure. No, you can use a much wider angle lens to give it an appearance that's probably more authentic. Makes it look a little bit more like how it would feel when you walk in there. But then you have these kind of fisheye wide angle lenses where they sort of warp uh, in the corners or Uh at the very edges of the screen. And those give you, you know, the effect of fisheye, but also a much more dramatic effect. Uh You can go from something like maybe like a 14 millimeter lens that's just going to look like a standard lens. You you probably wouldn't notice it at a moment's glance down to something like 10 millimeters where you get a little bit of warping. I mean, can you do you notice the stuff like that? The, oh, the yeah. wide angle shots like yeah, that? Yeah, for sure. It's a very I mean, it's a distinct look. It certainly is. It's, it's reminiscent of something like Dazed and Confused mm-hmm. where a lot of a lot of the shots are just like I mean, I just felt I think a lot of it was that fucking van. <laughs> sure. This, right. uh, but the van in the wide in the wide angle stuff just it screams dazed and confused, which is what you want. You want your film to look like a teen film and uh oh virus. Exactly. You create that kind of environment sure. first. It seems like Ty West set out to make a movie that wasn't about something bad that happened. And mm-hmm. it just happened that while he was shooting, a real horrible thing started sure. to occur. Sure. And he's just like, let's roll with it. Let's just let's Yeah, this just is shoot suddenly this. catfish and right. not cabin fever. Right. You know, then he moves from the wide angle lenses to, to something on the complete opposite side of the spectrum. Maybe not, uh, you know, macro shots or anything like that. But these close up shots with the shallow depth of field uh-huh. again. With you know, the fingernails really the, and the. Oh, God fucking damn it. Fingernails are not where you want shallow depth of field. So upsetting to your audience. That's exactly what you want. So we've talked too long without mentioning part of the real artistic masterpiece of Cabin Fever, which is Giuseppe Andrews. Yeah, that's true. Who also came up in Look and who kind of played a similar character. Yeah, he was also in Detroit Rock City. All over the fucking yeah. place. And 2001 Maniacs. Wow, we uh, covered him. Just rounding the bases on Giuseppe <laughs> Andrews. What a weird and phenomenally interesting He's character. Great. He's great. You know, the distinction between his sort of burnout character from something like Look yeah, uh, to this character who kind of speaks in a similar way. But I, how do you even describe this character? He's just he's really I mean, he's a cop and he is mm. a police officer. Sure. He's there. He he obeys the law. He does. You know, he does what he thinks is right. But his right under the priority of being a police officer is getting laid. Partying, and, right? Yeah, it's just partying, it's getting laid, and I think he just has a really difficult time kind of balancing whether he's sure. a cop or the party guy. Sure. So he he's just a friendly guy, he's mm-hmm. nice, but he also has this weird idea that everyone is just as into partying as he is, right? which I think is what creates the character, where all of his analogies, all of the things that he kind of talks about, you know... For example, when he, uh, Judah Friedlander at the water treatment plant, uh-huh. he's talking to him and instead of going, you're going to be a hero, people are going to remember your name as the guy that saved our town. Instead, he puts it in terms of the type of pussy he's going to get, right. which is the sashimi, which sure. means no smell. Thanks. That's that's the kind of person this cop is. He goes there to prevent a terrible thing from happening, but puts it in perspective of you're going to get some grade A vagina. This water is bull's hits. So here's the thing about Winston Olsen that's amazing. Um, and, and I guess just another reason that Ty West is amazing. You take a character that's really kind of, I don't know that I'd use a word like subtle to sure. describe him. But in Cabin Fever, you had this sort of dark brooding sense that there was something sinister about it. Yeah. You know, almost as if he's tricking these kids. Something wasn't quite right, and the, the kids even point on this it. out. Exactly, exactly. And you go through the whole movie, and it kind of walks this line constantly up to the last scene that we see replayed in Cabin Fever 2 in sure. sort of a flashback where he is dropping off the party man, and he's talking to him saying, oh, do you need some water? All I got is a 40. Big 40. Yeah, you know what? If you need some water, I'll get you some water. I'm going to take care of you, man. Don't worry about it. 
And then he drops the kid off and you just keep thinking sinister, sinister, sinister. What's going to happen? You know, they set it up. I mean, he's supposed to shoot the kid and then he's supposed to dispose of the body. And every time you see him, you just kind of assume that's what he's going to do. Right. He's acting super fucking sketchy. And so Ty West does an amazing thing with this character. Rather than feeding in to that sinister feeling, rather than saying, all right, we're going to expose the why he's like this. Right. You know, a, a common mistake you can make, take an interesting character and go, okay, here's why he's like this, or here's his real motivation or what's behind him. Now we get to mm-hmm. finally find out. We leave that thought lingering there. We told that part of that character and instead we're treating him not necessarily like the hero, but well, I would say the hero sure. in this movie. Well, I he's think I go detective. That far. Yeah. He's the guy that's that's slowly putting it all together from sure. the outside. Right. He's the one that's not a victim that still stands to put an end to it. He's the one that can do all the investigation, go to the water treatment right. plant, stop at Lucille's for some pancakes. Sure. And eventually he makes it out. Um, whether or not he's going to warn everybody, that's kind of left sure. ambiguous. Well, that's the amazing thing because you're staying true to that character. Right. He doesn't discover what's truly within him and become a hero. He's not even so much a reluctant hero. It's his job to right. be a hero. He's sure. the cop, right? And he knows. Yeah. So he goes to to do really what he can to help people. But once he realizes he's out of luck, self-preservation kicks in because sure. that's who he is. That's yeah. talking about his character. He's a cop, but that's really only his profession. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not what he's about, it's what not he worth lives giving by. giving up getting laid. It's his it's nine to five. giving up partying. Yeah. Absolutely. So when it looks like he might get shot, he fucking bails. Right. That's it. He gets in the van and he leaves. Not telling a story about why it seems sinister, why he's a weird guy. Instead, just saying, all right, now we're going to take this extremely interesting character, put him in a bizarre scenario. And realistically, how would he act? And that kind of writes itself. I mean, it's an incredible idea. It takes you a long way. Now, you mentioned a lot of the the violence in this sure. movie. The everything is gross um, factor. It's. I mean, that's what it is, yeah. right? Everything is fucking gross. Uh, but also, we have nudity. Both of these movies, a, a huge celebration on that note. But beyond that, because at this point, that's not enough of a challenge for sure. somebody like Ty West. What's even more awesome is we go that other end to the gross out factor and we go for this sort of cum gargling yeah. spit shot. Yeah. I, it's like, take that fucking ratings board. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. When is the last time you saw a cum shot in a feature length cinematic film? I don't think I've ever really seen one. I guess it doesn't count as a cum shot if the cum yeah. flies out of a woman's mouth. That's true. Rather Unless than- it lands on another woman's mouth. But I can't verify whether or not there was a woman's mouth in the sink. I mean, that's such a taboo of cinema. You don't even talk about it being a taboo of cinema. I would defy us, really, to find another cum shot in a movie for the rest of the year. Sounds like a really good time. I'm going to make that the challenge right now. So the movie's gross, and it has glorious semen. Uh, There's also the hand amputation scene. There is, is with the circular saw. Skillfully done. The whole thing feels almost like a suiting up montage, right? Like a building a weapon to kill the sure. killer, putting the pieces together. He, j- he just needs to attach a chainsaw to right. the stump. Exactly. That's all that's missing. And it it feels uh, bold for the characters when they do that. I almost can't. Believe it's it's come to that, and they've made the decision, and there's no hesitation. It's just like fuck it. That we got to remove your hand. And then the torch. I yep. mean, they're they're really being pros about this. They know what they're doing sure. here. Cauterizing the wound, it just seems so... And it's all for nothing. Yeah, exactly. Course. That's the best part, is that he doesn't get away. But she has her sort of sissy spacek moment, and sure. she gets away in the end, sort of. Kind maybe. of. She gets in the van with Winston and, and Rick, right. and they go to the place that they both know by looking at each other. And judging from the last person who was sitting in that seat in the van, yep. maybe not a great place to be. So two other quick things I want to talk to you about. One is the rabbit. Oh, yeah. Kind of come, you remember the weird rabbit oh, from I the end of Cabin Fever? Oh, I remember the rabbit. Which at that moment, I just understood as being Eli Roth. Sure. Just, oh, it's Eli Roth. Yeah. He put a rabbit in there. When you start to understand how that man works, it's just one of those things that kind of makes sense for some strange yep. reason. But Ty West almost goes on to explain the rabbit. I think he's rabbit. making an attempt. He's either making an attempt or calling the reference. I think it's just a reference. Because why would the rabbit be in the hotel room? Or know. in the, it's not a hotel, it's a hospital. hospital. Kind of like a hotel. The, uh, the other strange thing, though, and this is true, I suppose, of all 
quarantine type movies. Uh This might just be something that comes from effective movie making, but you fight for your protagonists. Yeah. But in a quarantine movie, you shouldn't be fighting for your protagonists if they're infected. I mean, we know these kids are infected. We still want them to get out alive. Right. But as humanists, we still we don't want to see people walk into a school and go, you look sick and shoot them in the head. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I guess there's a more effective way to, to deal with that. Well, by quarantining them would be really ideal. It's just quarantining well, them. You quarantine and then you purge at that point, don't yeah, you? Yeah, they were, they were purging by killing everyone. You purge and then you... It wasn't a very good quarantine. No. They left doors open. People are running around. It's like, hey, could you please go back in the school so we yeah. could shoot you? Poor quarantine, very effective purging. It seems strange, though, that some defense mechanism of an audience doesn't kick in. Because if you were to believe that this is, you know, uh, the real world, then if these kids get out, they infect all of humanity and kill everyone, uh, the audience included. You would think that you would be rooting for the quarantine, but you're never rooting for the quarantine. You uh, always I want the protagonist. Sometimes. <laughs> sometimes I find myself rooting for the quarantine. In a film you enjoy watching that you don't want to end 10 minutes before you <laughs> expect it, you never find yourself rooting for the quarantine. It's bizarre to me. We uh, we started a website, uh, I believe, four years ago today. Oh Jesus! Um, called DoubleFeatureShow dot com. You can uh, you can go there. You can download. You can look at all the directors that we've covered. And yeah, it's fastly becoming the greatest website in the look universe. Look at the uh, HD cover art that you, sir, have put together. Painstaking. That was painful. You know what I did is I actually went into each of those covers and photoshopped out all of the crappy text that was flying across the front of it. So it's just beautiful, minimalistic, 1,000 by 1,500 uh, cover art. It's great. The director's thing is fantastic, too, because if we've accidentally covered a director uh, several times John on the show, right, like John Carpenter, or in this case, Ty West or Adam Green, you can click on their name and there'll be a, a short little synopsis. And I wrote up a lot of these different descriptions in a way that one doesn't mention the movies because you'll find out about the movies underneath where it lists all the shows they're uh, mentioned in. But two is a really, really simple. I've never heard of this director before. Who is Steven Spielberg? What does he do? What's his thing? What's his style look like? It's uh, our attempt, I guess, to make films more accessible. Sure. Maybe then they even should be. Sure. It's possible that if you don't know Bride who's of the Steven, Cannibal 2. You're Steven saying Bride of the Cannibal Spielberg 2 right is. now. Okay, you're right. No, you win. You win this, hands down, Bride of the Cannibal 2. You could also email us uh, anything you want to. Um, we're still waiting on nude photos of most of our fan base. Double feature show at gmail.com for nude photos or text based sure. emails. Yeah, so next time we're going to cover two more films. We're going to do something. Weird. Wrong. Weird. Is wrong the word you we're, want? We're going to do something wrong next we're week. We're going to do something reminiscent of a disastrous failure we did once. Oh, God, I love it. This is the best blueprint for our show when, um, we, when we repeat our disasters. But we're embarking on a journey that we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk about at length next week. But suffice to say, the films are Rocky and Shogun Assassin. Here's all I'm going to say about this for now, just to give people a heads up. This is going to be part one of a, let's say, six-part sure. series of shows. Also, you should note that there are six Rocky films. We want you to take this journey with us. We don't want to tell you about the journey yet. We'll tell you about that next week. But watch these two films, and then we can go on this magical ride uh, through the rest of the year. It's going to be fantastic or a fucking disaster. One way or another, we're going to do it. Watch more fucking films. Bye.